So for those of you who have not been here, what I'd like to do is just give a very brief introduction to active design and what we're about. We have, we thank our sponsors, include in this case, um, and Hello Wallet. And then we have time for announcements, anything that's going on, other events, etc. at the end of the talk. Because we want to leave the main part for our speaker tonight, Michael Jason and his team from Social Radar. So for those of you who haven't been here before, Action Design DC is about the application of behavioral science, application of psychology-informed design to help users overcome obstacles. For people who want to take an action, like exercise more, like take control of their finances, what my company does, a wallet, but they struggle in some way. And we see that there's a great body of research in the academe, uh, both in uh, behavioral economics, psychology, and as well as, for that matter, marketing and sales, that we can apply to better understand why people fail to take that action when they want to. And so tonight, we're going to talk about key issues in that gap between intention and action. Why would somebody say, wants to get to know everyone in the crowd, wants to become involved with an organization, wants to become more socially active? They struggle. One of the key issues is, of course, they don't know who the heck the people are. But in order to do that, well, what, what tools are available? Social radar, obviously, is one of the new exciting tools for that. But more fundamentally, they're taking an approach that involves quite a lot of personal data. Personal data about who your friends are, about where you are, where your friends are, etc. And that question of trust and, and the privacy of one's data we find in other behavior change contexts as well. So I found it quite interesting for one, the particular problem they're working on, and, and, and the generality of that. And I should also say, for those of you who've been here before and, and know me, probably realize that I have an absolutely terrible memory. N not in the sense of, hey, you know, we all have bad memory, can't remember who the hell we are. But no, no, like, went to see a doctor, don't know why I have such a bad memory. In particular, never remember people's faces. Drives me bloody crazy. So I personally am here to listen to social radar. I've been using it myself. I love the idea of something that can help me see who the hell else is in a group so I don't always look like a group. <laughs> and I can't remember So, um, as I said, we will have some announcements at the end for community groups, but I just wanted to quickly thank Include for sponsoring the space tonight. Would you like to say something grand about Include? Real quick, uh, thank you guys for coming. You should know that with their efforts, we're able to raise money to support Bite Back. You're all here doing a great thing for DC and DC Tech. So thank you for coming and enjoying the In particular, the beer you drink. The more beer you drink, the more money we are giving to Bite So there you go. Do good for our city. Drink beer. Um, I should also say we have uh, recently set up a um, Twitter account uh, for the group. Uh, we individually have been tweeting about this for the last year. We now have a group one, which is Action Design DC. Very easy. Please follow it. You will see some tweets right now about the group, which hopefully you'll be sending out right now. Yes, use the hashtag. Thank you. Action Design. Okay. And with that, I would like to welcome Michael Chase, CEO of Social Radar. I believe many of you guys know him, also as uh, CEO of Blackboard. I'll let you introduce yourself. Great. Thank you. Oh, hello everybody. My name is Michael Chasen. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of a new, semi a new startup, Social Radar. And um, I, I, I know a number of people here in the audience, but before I kind of go into talking specifically about Social Radar and process of UI and UX, let me actually uh, take a minute also to give you a little bit of additional background on myself. Uh, I was also the co-founder and CEO of a large global e-learning company, Blackboard. And it was a very unique experience because I got to uh, start a company with a friend of mine out of uh, college. We actually rented a brown, so it was a couple of blocks down the street, the two of us, and grow a company to be this 3,000-person global worldwide leader in e-learning. And during that time, uh, we started with a single product, evolved to be a multi-product company um, with everything from uh, web-based tools to mobile-based tools. Started in just higher ed, and then ended up working with uh, K through 12 institutions, and for profit education institutions, and the government, and through all of these different uh, maturations and uh, through all this growth of the company, we were continuing to work with new and different clients around the world, and that, of course, all influenced and fed into uh, what we were designing and how we were designing the products. And I got to take a lot of that and bring that with me now to my next startup, Social Radar, 
And a lot of it has already, the, the processes that we learned and went through in my last one, they've influenced what we learn and how we operate at social radar. You know, and, and a lot of people, they actually say to me, they might, that, that was a, such a unique experience to do a startup, especially here on the East Coast, in education, and to see it grow to, to such a large degree, uh, 30,000 institutions and, and 30 million people on a daily basis using your products at Blackboard. How did you help keep all that in perspective? I, I always tell people that the, the, there were two ways in which I kept that in perspective. Um, the first was my mom. I, I remember I called up my mom on the phone. I said, Mom, can you believe it? I started a company with a friend of mine from American University, my old roommate, Matthew Kaczynski. And we grew this company from a two-person company with a single office in downtown D.C. to 20 offices around the world and 3,000 employees. What started as just a handful of clients, grew to a company serving 30,000 institutions around the world, 30 million users using Blackboard technology on a daily basis, over 100 million people that have used the technology in the, in the span of our technology being deployed at schools. We started as a small private company, went public in 2004 at a valuation of just around 400 million, and then eventually sold the company for $1.7 billion just over two years ago. And my mom said to me, that's great, son, but remember, you're not a doctor. <laughs> uh, Jewish mother. So <laughs> that always was one thing that helped kind of keep everything that happened to me in that journey in perspective. But the second thing that helped me keep it in perspective, that it wasn't actually luck that allowed uh, our team to grow Blackboard to be a successful company. It was these same principles of applying what we learned by working closely with the client and the design that allowed us to have successful applications that not only ended up being sold to the institutions, but highly adopted by the students on the campus. And it was this theory of applying design, this theory of working hand in hand with the clients and looking to maximize experience that I believe led to the success of the company. And then it was great. As the CEO of Blackboard, I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time also on college campuses. So when we sold the company, and my, as I was then winding things down over my last year before retiring from Blackboard, I was continuing to see new trends come up on college campuses. So at Blackboard, we actually see the, raise of, the rise of Facebook. Where we saw it uh, gain momentum at Harvard and spread to other schools. We saw that uh, students were starting to uh, not show up on campus with TVs, watching all their videos right on their computers. We saw the rise of, of instant messaging. And one of the things that we were seeing really over the last year or two was the adoption of location-based technologies on campus. And as it yet even really hit outside the millennials, but you know, today there's five million check-ins a day on Foursquare. There are six billion location events a year on Facebook. Uh, if you're a college freshman now, a lot of the, the kids, they'll actually connect with all their friends on Apple Find My Friends so they can always see where each other are. And all of this is taking place at the same time while there's this big discussion about privacy and am I sharing too much information in the NSA or are you watching me and I need to have controls. So uh, it's almost a little bit of a, of a bifurcation. Is this going to be a big trend or is this going to instead turn into just a, a, a big concern where people are going to kind of lock down around this? So I, uh, I sell uh, Blackboard and I, I took the weekend off and then uh, you know, started on, on Monday uh, on my next company, Social Radar. Um, and the idea behind Social Radar was just that. It basically um, built off upon the interest I had in, in location-based services and the fact that now there's over a, a billion smartphones in the world. And all of them are location beacons, if you will. They, they broadcast your technology, they, they broadcast your location all the time, even if no one is listening uh, out for it. And then at the same time, uh, there's over 2.8 billion user profiles uh, up in the cloud. And Yet no one has successfully cross-referenced the location information from the cell phone with the user profile information that's up in the cloud. Uh, so I thought that that was an opportunity because I believe that in the future you should be able to walk into a room, look down, and automatically have your smartphone or your Google Glass tell you that there's 10 people here that you know. Three of your friends, two of your coworkers, a friend from college, some of your aunts who last week down the street, and three friends of friends. And then on top of that, and then on top of that, uh, they should be able to tell you that, by the way, one of your friends from college just got married and one of your coworkers just got a promotion. Because all that information is up there in the cloud. So what I thought we'd do first is uh, watch a quick movie. Uh, OK, no, actually, well, we'll go ahead and uh, actually just end jump into it. Into the so let me, let me take only two more minutes and just let me quickly show you Social Radar and how it works. And then let me talk about the four big UI, UX design challenges that we face and how we address them. And then in particular, I have joining me here today two of our UI UX designers, and I'm going to share with you, and they'll come up as well.
talk about some of our overall design philosophies and principles. So I'm sure probably almost everyone here already has downloaded Social Radar. If you haven't, we just launched in the uh, iTunes store about uh, eight weeks ago. Social Radar, one word, search for it. Yeah, but it was still in like a late stage beta, so any kind of feedback you, know, you can give us, we certainly appreciate. But if you download Social Radar and you're here in DC, this is what it would look like, um, as this is a Social Radar. And instantly by looking at the screen, you see that there were 269 people around you, 37 of whom, 37 of whom were your friends, there were 75 friends and friends nearby. There were 76 professional connections nearby, 64 social connections, and people were checked into 11 places around you. Now these numbers would all change as you adjust the radar range at the bottom. So I can say, you know what, tell me just who is within a quarter of a mile, and then tell me who's within 250 feet, let me know everyone in Washington, D.C. So if I actually went a little bit closer and say, hey, who might be just within a mile of me, all these numbers will then adjust depending on that, that range. The way the social radar works is everyone who's using the social radar application is sharing their information, their location, contributing to the network. But as well, social radar monitors, Facebook, Foursquare, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, or Google+, for all the location events that happen on all of those networks as well. So if any of your friends are checking out on Foursquare, they're checking out on Facebook, and you can see in your feeds on those networks, we gather that information together in one place as well, put it all on social radar. So I might want to say, oh, there's 38 people already, let me see who they are, I'll go ahead and tap on the everyone. And this will actually pull up all of the people that are, uh, some of the people that are actually right here already. Um, and I can see there are a bunch of people that are uh, uh, pretty close by. Um, uh, and very quickly we summarize who the person is, uh, their position, um, their place of employment, where they work, how many friends and things you have in common. Um, and in the corner it's showing you I'm getting this information from social radar, it's a little social radar icon. But if I continue to go down here, here I can see, oh, uh, Tommy McFly, a friend of mine, he's the host on uh, 94.7, uh, our uh, radio station right around there. He's checked in on Foursquare, so he doesn't actually realize that I'm picking him up on social radar, but he shared his location with me through Foursquare, so again, we had to get together. And he's close by, let me see where he is, I can go ahead and click on Tommy, and I'll go ahead and click on location. And I can very quickly see, oh, he's right down the street. And if he was a little bit closer, I wanted to know how to get to him, I can go ahead and just click on radar and I can walk right over to him. He's in that direction. Or if he's a little bit further away on the map, I can go ahead and uh, get driving directions uh, to uh, get myself uh, right to his location. Now the idea of social radar, though, isn't just to tell you who is nearby. It's also to help put in context how you're connected to those people and give you the information on what they've been up to. I have 2,000 friends on Facebook. I'm ever, obviously very popular online. I have eight friends in real life, so there's obviously some sort of disconnect. <laughs> um, so I might want to say, oh, you know, let me see, uh, there's a, uh, someone nearby, uh, 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 Victor. I obviously know Victor because he's shown up here on my location feed and we're obviously connected somehow, but I may not realize how do I know Victor is. So I can go ahead and click on Victor. And I can uh, flip through his photos if he has any uh, photos. I can read his profile and uh, reacquaint myself with um, how I might know him. I can go ahead and click over to his other social networks. I can see here that we have four things in common and 22 friends in common. I don't remember who Victor is. I'm going to go ahead and click four things in common. Let me see what it is. Ah, yes, we both work at Social Radar. And that is how I know Victor. <laughs> now I remember him. It's a bad memory. It's a small startup, too. Eh? It's not a memorable guy, I guess. Um, well, now that I've actually caught up and kind of remembering how I know Victor, um, uh, obviously I could uh, click on location and see where he is, but then since I know he's here, I can go ahead and click on social because I want to go up and talk to him, but let me see what he's been up to. We aggregate together all of his social network feeds in one area as well. Again, only showing what you'd otherwise be able to see in those feeds. So if you weren't friends on Facebook, I certainly wouldn't have access to his Facebook information, but, and we're not, so I don't, but I can see his tweets, his force were checked in, and we're friends on LinkedIn. So I can very quickly see that he uh, just posted a top 10 spring motorcycle checklist. He's obviously into motorcycles. Um, and I can see uh, uh, other things that he has uh, going on, and maybe I want to go up and uh, ask him about uh, his job or his uh, motorcycle, because that's what he's been focusing on lately. Now, I've been showing you all this in a, uh, in a list view, but I can say, you know what, let me get a, a sense of what friends might be around. So I can go ahead and click on map in the upper right hand corner and flip this to a, a map view and make, uh, go in a little bit uh, closer and just see uh, who, is, uh, who is all around uh, right now. So there's Victor right in the room with me. And, um, and then in addition to that, I'm just showing you kind of a high level um, people around us. I can go into professional. And I was searching for uh, people that might work at my old company, Blackboard. There's 16 people around, or eight people from Social Radar nearby. I could go into uh, social. 
Let me see any social connections. Oh, there's uh, some from the Jewish people. There's 10 Jewish people nearby. So people might speak Arabic. I'm not interested in that anymore. I can, of course, just swipe and delete it. And uh, if I want to add something new, all I have to do is click Add in the corner. I can say, you know what? I'm working on a paper. Maybe I have some other particular interest. Uh, maybe I'm looking for a back to languages. Anyone around that speaks Chinese? And let's go ahead and add that. And now uh, it'll search and let me know there's one person that speaks Chinese nearby. And I can go in and find that person. Now, when you give this much power in the, in the hands of people, you're talking about sharing location information, other personal information, we need to make sure that people can also control their privacy. And the number one thing is we're speaking to our early users and when we're testing this idea, they said, you know what, this is all great, but what if I don't want people to see where I am? How, how can I control that? And so right at the top, we say, who can see when right now everyone can see me? But I can say, you know what, I don't want everyone to see me, I only want my friends to see me. So I can just move that to friends. Or more specifically, I can say, you know, I don't want anybody to see me, and I can be visible. And also, you know, we, 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 we talk a lot of people say, you know, I don't mind if other people say from my job reach out and, and contact me, but I, I want them to have to ask permission first. So we go ahead and we have it on anonymous as well. So it'll just show up that someone nearby worked at Blackboard. You can send them a message, oh, you work at Blackboard, I worked at Blackboard too, who are you? And the person can decide if they want to engage and, and share with you or not. So we put that right at the forefront. And then um, there's a lot of other advanced features as well. You can do everything from check your, send people messages and chat, check your messages. You can go ahead and use uh, social radar as a central check-in place. You can check in on social radar and we'll push it out to all of your other networks. Um, you can go ahead and control your battery life. And uh, we also have a very powerful alert-based system. So even if you're not using social radar, if you walk down the street, it'll send you an email or a cell phone notification of a friend of yours who's been on and you can control all of that as well. So this was a, a, a kind of a, a very quick demo of the product, but I do encourage you to download it, especially since a lot of UI, UX, and uh, advertising PR expertise in the room would love to get initial feedback from you. But let me go ahead and then talk specifically about when we were looking to develop the app, some of the challenges, the big, big challenges that we were facing um, and, and how we kind of addressed it from a UI perspective. I'm just going to press this button and magically someone will come over and switch the wires for me. <laughs> tell you 
who was around you, how many people, how many friends were around, how many of your coworkers were around, when was the last time you ran into a person. So big sets of numbers that in the first version of RAP just looked like we had an application that's a big table of numbers. So how do you take this great feature set, a complex product, and then make it and mold it into something that people could just open up the first time with no instructions used and have a pleasurable experience in doing so. So let me talk about each of these challenges in a little bit more detail and how we looked to address them. So um, the answer to all of those challenges were uh, these three people. This uh, handsome fellow uh, here at the beginning, and uh, then uh, Lee and Roberta, the two members of our UI UX team. Because we weren't going to be addressing all of those issues uh, just by trying to go out and convince people, right? It's too many people to try to convince that, oh, it's okay that we have your big data, or okay, uh, don't worry about privacy, we're going to build the feature set. The way to address all of them was through the user experience. How can you address people's concerns just by making your app usable and friendly to alleviate those concerns in almost a, a, a sub kind of sub <coughs> type of way. So it was left up to this group to try to address those big challenges. So let me tell you what we came up with. So control over privacy seemed to be the number one issue with our with our with our insolvency. So we want very easy control over whether people can see me or not. Now at the same time though, it has to be easy. In fact, the biggest critique that we also heard was that Facebook, which had great privacy on every item, was too complex. People couldn't figure out how to use that. And maybe that was okay because we were still deciding what to share, but if we're talking about sharing a location, then this needed to be something that was very, very simple. And now the interesting thing was that even when we were talking about uh, allowing you to change between these different uh, gradations of sharing and privacy, people didn't necessarily understand like what that meant. So, we spent a lot of time to manage to simplify all of these different privacy options into the four key areas that we felt people mostly would fit into. Whether they were sharing their location with everyone, sharing it with just their friends, wanted to be anonymous or invisible. And not that there weren't other lots of gradations uh, of that, but we wanted to say, all right, from a, from a simplicity perspective, we want anyone to be able to understand, we're going to limit it to those four general buckets. And then, more so, we wanted to then make it that it was very easy to switch between them. So as we, of course, looked at the various different types of controls that were right there, we said, you know what, what might make sense is, you know, we don't want it to take a large amount of real estate, so we applied very specifically a small wheel control at the top. But one of the challenges that we found, even when doing this, was that people would switch between everyone, or friends, or invisible or anonymous, and they would still say, well, what does that mean? How are other people seeing me? And even though we thought it was clear, we said, well, everyone, everyone can see you, or anonymous, they, they see you, but not exactly who you are, or invisible, you don't show up. People said, well, I don't understand how are people perceiving uh, me within the app. So we did a little bit of a custom control here where when you slide and when you're selecting, we automatically would expand the control to actually show you what you're trying to do. And uh, this uh, allowed people right away to get the direct feedback they need to say, oh, they switched to anonymous? Oh, it says it showed them as anonymous, so whether they're a male or a female or whatever information was showing on their specific card. And they instantly got how other people were going to perceive them within the application. Now, the, the, the interesting thing here is that, so we did all this work and we tested it and we found that these four buckets were the good general buckets, and then we showed how people could uh, even then understand um, how they were perceived. And then what we found in testing was that the first time people used the app, they actually went to it, saw how it worked, said it to everyone, or said it to friends only, and just left it there. So the majority of people not even actually using the privacy control. But yet, it was the number one issue for utilizing this type of app, and we found that when people install it, it's one of the first things that they look for. So here we're actually developing a UI and UX that comforts the people to know that that type of control is there even if they are using it. Which is why on one hand we wanted to make it at the forefront of the screen and at the top of the area, but yet uh, small enough that it doesn't take up too much real estate because it turns out, turns out to not be a commonly used The second item that we worked to address was the fact that a lot of people said, you know what, I don't want to share my location. Well, you know, I'm, a, I'm a private person, I don't know about that. And yet that is almost in direct contradiction to the fact that there are 5 million Foursquare check-ins every day. 6 billion location events are shared on Facebook. 
And people said, well, it's too invasive. It's too, too much information that I'm sharing. And it, and it reminded me of the very um, first <coughs> blog post that Mark Zuckerberg posted when they invented the Facebook timeline. There was a big uproar when the timeline came out. People said, oh my god, this is shared too much. People are going to know everything that you do. It's completely invasive. And he actually wrote a blog post that said, hey, everybody, calm down. You can control what you put up there. We have these privacy controls. And he went on to say that you don't have to use it if you don't want to. And they're building uh, just a foundation for people that want to share and have the privacy built in so you can limit what you share to who. And then, of course, today no one has those type of concerns that I'm sharing too much on, on Facebook. People do it all the time. And so similarly, once we realized that people were already sharing their location, so we just needed to kind of bring it to the forefront in two ways. So one, what I know we did, we built a, the same type of check-in that you could do on Foursquare or many other social networks. We, we copied that functionality. Now, with social radar, you don't really need a check-in because as you're walking around, your location is being contributed back to the network. But nonetheless, we thought this is a, a, a tactic that people are already used to. So let's build in this type of functionality. So we you know, did the very similar type of check-in screen that you'll see on other applications. We have a map, places around you. We, Brought to the top place you recently checked in at. You can go ahead and set up and check in the social radar headquarters. You can simply check in the way you can elsewhere. And even though it's almost like a little bit additive, because the truth is you already know if you're in social radar headquarters because you're like there and you're a smartphone on you. Then we said, we know that since we're all location app, we want to also kind of give back to the other social networks as well. We added an option that, hey, when you check in, you can push that location app to all of your other networks. So use social radar to check in. And then we'll push it out to Facebook or Foursquare or Twitter or wherever you want to broadcast your location. Now at the same time, we said, okay, well, that's great so people can check in in a way that they're familiar with. But we also realized that you know, we don't have to always be asking people to um, uh, use our application to check in when they're checking on other networks. So let's make it very simple to just monitor those other networks for when people check in on them and pull that information in. Why make them do something twice? If you're already checking in on Foursquare, let you continue to check in on Foursquare. Let's make sure we're getting that data. So in multiple points within our application, we ask you to connect to your other social networks. We do it right away when you enter the application for the first time. We explain, hey, to get social radar to work, we need to be connected to your other networks. And we ask you to go ahead and connect. And the other point within the application, we raise that ability to go back right from the side menu or from settings. You can go ahead and connect to your other networks. And we have a very high percent of people that are on Facebook that have linked to their Twitter or their Foursquare or their LinkedIn uh, or their Instagram accounts. And then that lets us already monitor for the location events and just bring those in. So we actually either are removing the necessity for them to have to check in on our application or checking in in other places and we, and we bring that in. And when we talk about this and when we show people this, we said, you know what, you're already, this isn't new, you're already checking in, you're already sharing your location. Well, again, the, the, the early uh, beta customers that we spoke to and people that were testing around with had a sense of relief there. They realized, oh, right, I, I'm already sharing my location. It's not on Foursquare. In fact, they check in all the time. So, of course, that's fine. If you're checking in on Foursquare, it's public. I don't mind the social radar is bringing that in. So, again, making it even easier for people to just accept that location information is already out there and how we pull that into the application. The third item that we wanted to address was the fact that this. I mean, I may have explained this product in a, in a very quick and simple way, and obviously the people in this room are people who are well-versed in technology, but there's actually a lot of complexity behind our application and how it works. And in addition, not only is it a, a, a complex product, but we're gathering together such a large set of data, and people have concerns about companies collecting more set of data, but yet without it, social radar doesn't work. So right away, as soon as people came in, we focused on having a great opening experience for the users. And, and we went through multiple revisions, and I can tell you that we're, we're still only halfway there. But we let people look and see what the app was, and then immediately pulled up just a very, very quick, short tutorial walkthrough that hit upon a couple of the highlight points that we knew were the immediate uh, pain points or concern points for people. So we said, hey, let me tell you quickly how does social radar work. It's, it's a very simple product that tells you who's nearby, how you're connected, and what they've been up to. What makes it unique? We focused on, hey, don't worry, you can adjust your privacy. You can control the battery life of the product. You can customize it easy. And most importantly, though, we're bringing in information that's already available on your other networks, easy for you to set up. And we just focus on those key points. And those are the same things that we continue to reinforce over and over again throughout the application. So right away, since we knew that these were the four big problems that people faced, we're addressing them front on, right in the UI, right in the wizard walkthrough uh, when they join the application. 
And then, you know, what started as an application that was a kind of a large table with a list of numbers, we said, okay, well, you know, the front page we believe needs to be a form of a dashboard. But how do we make that more engaging? We went through a lot of iterations. But what I want to show you about you know, this UI, and we've gotten some pretty good positive feedback about the UI, is we said, okay, well, for a location-based app, let's choose some beautiful pictures in the background. And even though you know, we're not a weather app or um, you know, we're not a, a, a tourism app, that doesn't mean that we can't have it be an enjoyable first experience when people come to it. So if you're in Washington, D.C., we load a, a stunning picture of D.C. kind of just behind the numbers, use a little bit of a semi-transparency, hard to see in the PowerPoint, but of the, uh, of the table sets here. If you're in Virginia, we have a stunning landscape of some uh, landmarks in Virginia, Maryland. In fact, every state, we uploaded a, a handful of beautiful pictures just to use in the backdrop to try to kind of soften the fact that we were really looking at the numbers. We had you know, let you know, obviously, you're in Washington, D.C., to give us a little bit more space to let the design show through. And then we divided up the table into the two main areas, the people around you, the connections around you, to give a little bit of a show through. So again, um, we're letting the picture come through, because otherwise what you're looking at is a, is a table full of numbers. Also, what we really focused on was, you know, removing the, uh, the button bar at the bottom, even though it's so common in a lot of the applications today. We wanted to, to make this a simple puzzle, like almost no buttons would have been our preference. So we limited it to just a slider on the bottom, so you can select the range in which you want to uh, view the information, whether it's 100 feet or 100 miles. Um, we still had to have two buttons on the, on the page if you're, you're mail and checking in. So, uh, you know, we, we managed to kind of uh, move those to the upper right hand corner. Um, you know, and, and every day we try to figure out, do we really even need two buttons because we want this to be a simple experience where someone can come on board? And I mean, look at this screen, there's not a lot to do. It's very simple. You can adjust your radar range, you can adjust whether people can see you, uh, and then you can give us a You can go ahead and click on that. It's a pretty simplistic interface. And what we see from the testing is that people are able to just pick up look at the app for the first time, click around, and, and get around it. Even though it's a, it's a new type of app, it's a new type of feature set, people very quickly are able to pick it up and, and dive into some of the more advanced pieces. Now, again, this, we're basically saying, okay, all we're doing is presenting numbers in a list format, and then you can go and look at the uh, page of people start. Well, we wanted to humanize that in a way. We didn't just want it to be a list of people and their basic information. So we said, all right, let's kind of have it be a little bit like a, a business card. You know, like, and, we, and we utilize this in our marketing as well. So the idea when we talk about social radar, we kind of say, hey, in the future, a little information will be floating above everybody's head. And we actually use that in our marketing advertising. So this is reinforcing this idea. It's not just like a list of people you might see in the context, but these are the, the physical representation of the future. I'll be wearing my Google Glass. And I may not remember that, that, uh, that Victor is right here in the, in the front of the presentation, we might have it has his head, I should say his name, all the key information. And certainly that's where we're going. So we wanted to start to incorporate some of that type of UI design into our product. And then also, even in the, the simplistic things, we are, we don't have a lot then to do on our app. We're clicking on a number and getting a list of people, and even if it's a, a good looking list, you know, what else can we do on our app? Right, you can do side menu, you can look at your messages. So each one of those things, we said, how can we make that experience more enjoyable? So we took the side menu and we kind of added a 3D effect and then you can actually grab this and move it in or out. And uh, you can't, of course, see this, but there's a, a very light wave going through the, the, the background, a radar wave, if you will, in the, in the background of the app. So we tried to take uh, what are otherwise very uh, basic actions, looking at a side menu, loading the uh, messages, um, and made them a more enjoyable UI experience to offset, again, the fact that our app is pretty much a, a large listing dashboard of numbers. And I think that we've done it because when we show people the UI, we actually, uh, you know, and, and as you've been testing it, the, um, the, the feedback has been more and more positive with each iteration because even if this is not a game or it's not some leading virtual reality 3D, you know, UI, it, it, even though really at its core it's a basic listing of numbers, we've taken just even the simple interactions and made them a more enjoyable experience, um, which we believe makes the app also more engaging. So, now all of this uh, was done um, in, uh, in, in uh, myself and all of the developers working hand in hand uh, with our designers. And of course, the designers themselves have a, a little bit of a unique philosophy for how they look at design uh, and, and especially kind of action oriented design. But let me actually have Lee come join me uh, up here. Um, and uh, uh, it's just like a, a picture. Um, and, and, and maybe just take a second and, and, and share uh, kind of some of your design philosophy and what you apply as we went through this process. Okay, we'll do. So I'm Lee Culling, Creative Director and Head of UI UX at Social Radar. And um, so why, why do I do UI UX and why Social Radar? Well, uh, I think as a UI UX designer, you need to come to work and you need to sit down and think, am I creating something visionary? Am I creating something that people might not know they need, but they actually need? that they do, and they're engaged and drawn into it. Um, so there's a process that can help with 
said, OK, well, we think our app is like Google Maps. This may seem like a big disconnect, but let me, let me explain why. I, I, we would ask ourselves, you know, when you, when you um, with Google Maps, I always ask people, did you, before you had a smartphone, did you carry around an atlas or a, or a big paper map in your pocket all the time? And yet, people today use Google or Apple Maps I mean, almost every single day. So here was a technology that was, uh, people didn't realize it necessarily needed, and now it had become mission critical. And at the same time, it's not that Google Map is loading for a specific reason to drive you to a place. It's not like saying, hey, hey, or check out this restaurant. It's, you're using it as a general piece of information. You know where you want to go, where you don't, there's one thing that goes around you. So, yeah, and it's all used in all these different situations. So, how do you test it? So, we, we listed all of those same possible functions that we could use with our application and then start speaking to users in each of those categories. But the important thing here is that well, even though we were speaking to the usability for dating or for networking, we would then kind of put on the side this, the, the feature set that made it specific for that category. So, people said in dating, we should be able to say, hey, I'm single and looking for a date tonight. People networking said, oh, very specifically, you should immediately ask what type of network are you going to do. And those are the things that fell to the frame. The things that then all fell within that, that core center circle, that's what we focused you know, the features on. And so by speaking to all the different groups, but looking for that common functionality, that's where we focused on developing our app. Because we saw ourselves more like a Google Maps a general purpose map that could be used for all the different things, but we didn't want to lean the usability towards uh, one or the other and move us out of that, that, that general capability category. But we, we still tested individually for all those. So we would identify people in each of those buckets go and demo and talk with them and the later on the app uh, to make sure that we get that good general feature set. Yes? Um, you used on-street instructions for when the first person goes in, I think you called it a wizard. Um, did you have any debate as to whether it would stand on its own and should be intuitive that you don't need instructions? Uh, yes, uh, and we also debate that, I would say, almost every day so, uh, because of course, some of the people in the marketing team say, we want zero friction in getting into the app. Let them get in and experience. Um, then we said, you know, but our, our app is a little bit unique because there are these high level of concerns about privacy. And we know that if you can just say this phrase, you can control your privacy, that that addresses the big amount of that was the way. Um, so, we here allow the analytics to speak for themselves. So, um, we, uh, when we launched the app, we actually put tracking on every single page from login to through the, through the wizard. And it turns out that if you log into our app, we're getting close to 90% of the people go through the wizard and, and enjoy the app. So it was a very high percent. Um, we, we actually can't skip our wizard, but, but we were only losing 10%. And then when we took the wizard out, uh, we actually were getting people not just only checking in. And, I mean, we were all, all, I mean there, there was a, a, a little bit of friction there, but it was such a minor percent that we said, all right, well, then the wizard isn't inhibiting people from using the application. So we ended up to leave it in. There was something that was a constant debate on the level of friction, but once we were able to test the numbers, we showed it did appear to be an inhibitor for people utilizing our application. All the way in the back, yes. Yeah, um, I was curious, so for detecting, you know, if you have a friend, might be a hundred feet away. How exactly? I know that it uses, you know, your Facebook or your Twitter. Um, but how does it see it? Is it that each phone is talking to each other? Is it going through a cloud? If you're to draw a diagram, what goes for what? Sure. So uh, very good question. So how does the location service? Work? So um, there are really three ways our location services work. Uh, two only two of which we've implemented so far. So. One is, very generally, we look for check-ins across all the other networks. So if you're not on social radar, but you checked in here, I know you're in the building. Hard for me to know exactly how far away you are from me. Usually the check-ins kind of have a set of one in the building. And either not that accurate, but we generally can place you in location. If you have social radar, though, and you're sharing your location with your friends or everyone, there we are using the GPS uh, to get your location live when you're using the app or kind of a time interval GPS in the background to update your location every once in a while so you know where you are in the distance of where you might be to your friends. Now, uh, the Apple location services are only accurate, best case they say 25 feet, really I've seen it sometimes 75 or 100 feet inaccurate. But with the new iBeacon technology that is out, uh, that does a low range Bluetooth that will be very accurate for people within 100 feet. So for our next large generation of the product, we are already doing 
you know, uh, the um, location from check-ins from other networks. We're doing the live location update utilizing GPS when you're running the app. We're going to incorporate Bluetooth technology so that then when you're within a room, for other people running social radar, I'll, we'll literally know you're two feet away, five feet, or ten feet. Right now, if it says you're within 100 feet, you kind of could be anywhere within that 100 feet. It's not, it's not really accurate. But those are the three ways in which we incorporate location data together, or two of which we do. So the two people have, it's just on the phone and they're not checking in at places and there's no beacons yet. Um, is that going through a server to process it or how? Yeah, so if you and I just both in social radar and we just showed up here today, uh, it would say that we were anywhere probably from 25 to 100 feet okay. close to each other and that's connecting back to the social radar server, each of our locations to determine that and then send that information back to your phones. Cool. Yes? How do you have any interest from law enforcement? Um, our privacy policy says that we will not give your information to the NSA and also no one has asked us. Um, so no. And we're, we're, we're also a very early stage company um, and you know, we have a, a very strict privacy policy that you know, we're not going to be sharing your location information with other people unless, I mean obviously they're a sort of word, but uh, we're not going to let the NSA do any backdoor encryption to our software. Uh, also, we uh, don't have our address published, so we can't find out where we are. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Foiled again. Yes. When do you plan to launch Monos? Um, so we should be out in Google Glass over the next couple of weeks, and then Android will follow us a couple of weeks later. I think about uh, six, six weeks, eight weeks. Hmm? Oh, Windows Phone. Oh, uh, <laughs> really? Why are you? As soon as I hire Windows developers. Then have to develop products. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the way in the back. Um, I have a question about the background. So I think you did a really nice job of letting people know how your battery is being used. That's my big concern. But I noticed when I put it in off, and the applications in the background, the location thing is still on. So what's 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 happening in the background with location services? So <coughs> um, <coughs> the reason that the 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 uh, address is still on is we, we use a little bit of a mixture of some of the built-in location services of significant distance and, and geofence, which then when you move to larger location, uh, to different locations, it'll then do a location update even though it's not continuously on, and that just causes the arrow to stay on. So it's not getting your location every minute, but just even utilizing one of those services in your iPhone leaves the uh, icon on. So that will that be on all the time that you, you have it installed on your iPhone? Um, I think, wait, so that doesn't, the arrow is that on all the time. Uh, right, but it, it's different, it depend, the, I mean, the arrow might be an outline instead of like fully uh, formed it's, in. It's full. It's, well, it's then, it on. depends on that if you move, whether you've gotten a location update or not. So then, but if you literally did move for a long period of time, uh, then the arrow will appear to be just outlined, but then it will fill itself well, in. Well, except that I set it to off so that it says on the instructions that it shouldn't be doing that. Oh, you're saying it's still doing it? Yeah. Uh, uh, could be a okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, you, did a, you did a nice job better hey, than... Hey, 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 it's all right. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, no, no, I'm just kidding. Um, we'll it's a mystery. We'll come to afterwards. Okay. okay. No worries. Yes. This question is sort of about kind of UI, UX, but also about more broad resources. No, no, wait. Right. You know, I, know the, I think I know the answer to the question. It's, it's because uh, we actually still declare that we are using significant distance or, or, or location update, and even though we're not actually then getting your location on time okay. intervals. I think it's because we've said that our app does that, which is what causes it to show. But okay. let me still get But back. I want to I say you did a much better job than Foursquare does by telling people what you're doing. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yes. So, you know, with what you just mentioned about, like, launched eight weeks ago, and some of the, like, the user examples that you brought up about, like, someone who's already sharing a bunch of stuff on Foursquare, like, it's obvious that you're kind of in that early adopter phase. And I wonder kind of what you you know, if you sort of look into a crystal ball, like what it looks like kind of taking this mainstream and how you see kind of UI, UX kind of helping mediate that sort of transition. Um, if you have one of those crystal balls, please send it to me. <laughs> I um, so, uh, look, you know, the, it was interesting. We, we were even having a discussion on the way here. You know, there was a time when um, you were able to use UI, UX as a differentiating factor for your own. You had a really good UI or UX. <coughs> Uh, like Apple did with their early app and some of the early uh, leaders like Path and sites, that was a, uh, an advantage for you because you had that, you had a beautiful app that people did. At this point, everybody knows the importance of UI, UX, and the app structure. I would argue that I mean, almost all the apps you see, I mean, the many of them 
crap, a good number of them on this beautiful app. So it's, it's no longer a competitive differentiator. You actually need to do it to just be in the middle average of the pack. The reason why UI and UX are so important to us is because, and again, I hopefully explain this relatively simple, there's an incredibly complex set of features behind this, the way you divide up the data, you're looking at the tables, and the location information. So we didn't use it to just have a, a beautiful experience, but we use it to try to make a complex situation easy to handle and understand. So for us, it's more about the usability than it is just having a beautiful experience, although these two lights also focus to make sure it's also a beautiful experience. Uh, we're finding out more and more with every kind of jump in numbers and how people are using it. So when we had 1,000 people on it, we got a certain set of data back and made some improvements and we had 10,000. Now we're just at the you know, 50,000 uh, download market, so that's giving us more data. And we do continue to refine the UI to try to remove features or, or, or make them simpler to use. So I think that process, so if, you're, if I'm looking into a crystal ball, I, I don't see big change from the process of what we're already doing today, which is that for each milestone of larger amounts of users, we continue to look and see can we refine our app to uh, make sure that this broad audience is, is able to use it or not. Now, when I really look into that crystal ball that you have, in the future, though, I, I believe we're not just talking about having 100,000 or a million people who use this type of technology. No, I believe that this technology five years from now is going to be built into your iPhone, uh, like the same way that Google Maps is. I, I find it weird today that you sit down in a restaurant. And I came to this room, and, and there's probably somebody in here that the name I may not remember off the top of my head, or somebody that probably worked for me at Blackboard, and we're going into a restaurant and sitting down next to someone and not knowing at all if you're connected to them or having maybe a friend of yours around the corner that you just don't see because they're literally being blocked by a wall and yet they're literally eating in the same restaurant as you. I, I, I was at, I was at um, CES uh, in, in, in Vegas and I came back to my hotel and I walked into my lobby. One of my board members, we had 12 board members at Blackboard, so an ex-board member, was in the lobby leaving and I saw him. And then I, in my hotel, I didn't even know he was there, he was leaving town. And then I walked in about 20 more feet and I ran to another board member. She didn't know that the other board member was, it was just a coincidence. And then I walked over to the elevator and out of the elevator came a friend of mine from college. This is all within five minutes. I randomly ran into three people at CES. I mean, there must have been dozens, if not a hundred other people at CES that were in Vegas at that same time that I just didn't know. And you don't think that's weird today because the technology doesn't exist to tell you that, but I can tell you that once you've solved that problem, once you're able to know kind of who's around you and how you're connected to them, that in the future you'll go to a conference, a restaurant, a meeting, an event, look down, ah, there's five people here I know, and here's what they've been up to, let me go connect with them, or let me avoid them. Whatever, whatever your preference. <laughs> so, some people are laughing uncomfortably. So, uh, so, when I look at my crystal ball as far as the process, I see us continue to do the same thing. But I see, quite frankly, this type of technology fundamentally changing, I, mean, I believe, the way people interact. And I hope it's our version of it, social radar. It may or may not be, but it will certainly be some type of similar technology, I believe, in the future that everyone will be using. Other questions? Yes? How about the, the business model? You're going to target ads, you're going to target content, presumably, eventually? Yeah, well, we think there's an opportunity, some pretty specific targeted commerce opportunities. You know, we have your you know, background data, right. we know where you are, you're going to so store. we can say, hey, you, you, right. you drive to work every day by Starbucks, you've only stopped it once in the last week, maybe Starbucks wants to offer you something to, to come by again. There's a lot of commerce opportunities we can do, but, then, but you know, right now, what we're focused on is two things, getting the technology to work, right. and making it a great user experience. Yes? Um, this is a question about your UX process for designing. Can you talk about whether you use personas and how many you use? Can you pause the video or something like that? Well, I don't know if you forgot the name. John. The personas are people. We we keep our personas kind of real time, real people, and we we're testing constantly on everyone, family members, friends. And Somebody was near me uh, who I didn't know. And so I just went and asked them to their experience was you know, we're having any difficulty in you know, that type of thing. We try to keep it real. Uh, so we, we in our marketing plan when we originally developed it, we had our top kind of five personas that we thought fit that we were developing the application for. But we actually found very quickly is that those are great personas on, on paper. And whenever we even spoke to someone that we thought kind of fit into that general persona, um, the feedback was far removed from what we would have guessed. So we kind of then moved to what Lee was talking about, which was, all right, we, we had these, for our marketing plan, we did have these five personas. I don't remember any of their names. They were all close sounding names. And better looking people than actually the people we ended up really speaking to, because we were using the model photos. 
But um, that, that nonetheless, what we found was that even though that kind of gave us a good starting point, we needed to just get real users in front of us as soon as possible, and those were what we gave us the best feedback. Yes? So, sorry for the extra complexity, but uh, um, one of the things I was thinking about when you're talking about all the different directions you want to take social radar or consider it for meeting people um, socially, professionally, uh, and randomly, I was, uh, one of the important things I've seen with people is that they uh, actually see themselves as different people and want to present different kinds of information based on the kind of situation they're in. And I was wondering, uh, uh, which takes two directions, is one, uh, do, you, do you actually take any steps to uh, craft what information gets broadcasted depending on which, uh, and, uh, whether you're trying to find a date or trying to make a networking connection? And two, uh, do, uh, do you have any uh, interest in trying to build up any kind of your own social uh, scene and social following to keep people uh, uh, using and interacting with, uh, with your application? Those are both great questions and one we, we, we often find ourselves discussing. Um, uh, let me handle it in reverse order. Uh, yeah, so okay. of course, early on in the discussions, are, are we really trying to create our own social networking? And what we decided was that we, we weren't. First of all, there are great social networks already out there, whether you're you know, older using Facebook or younger using Tumblr or Instagram or Vine. You know, about, to us, the social networks were about sharing content. But a lot of those social networks, people started sharing their location, and we really saw ourselves a little bit more of a utility of telling you who was around you, as opposed to saying, and let's engage with them in any particular way. Uh, I mean, that, another analogy, we, we kind of think that our app is more like texting. Uh, it's just a straight utility platform. Now, people text for dating. In fact, actually, the number one dating app, it turns out, is texting. Uh, but, uh, you know, people text for work, people text for just connecting with the family. So similar, like, okay, yeah, we, we kind of see our app in that general category. We don't think we're qualified to compete with the social networks. And we were building all of those type of extra free content type features. Um, so going first question, yes, I very much believe that there are different kinds of, there are use cases that have to be slightly molded to better fit, and in the future we thought of us letting people kind of define as they're coming in, hey, what's the persona that I actually want to show, what am I looking for today, am I looking for dating, am I looking for business, but uh, haven't yet been able to kind of get that into the product, but it's on a long-term move now. Thank you. Yes? This is kind of a low-level question, but once you get to the app, you're able to connect to all of your different social profiles, but I noticed when you're logging in, the only login option you get is Facebook. And I was just curious if you chose that for a reason or? We did, for Facebook or LinkedIn. What is it? Uh, you can use. Um, so yeah, so logging into our app, you have to log in with Facebook or LinkedIn. Uh, although you can then connect your Twitter, or your Instagram, your Google. And the reason because we determined that, especially when you're dealing with a, a, a product that has location, a lot of personal information, we want everyone in it to be real. We don't want to worry about a lot of fake. And not that you can't fake with Facebook all those things. But for whatever reason, kind of the Facebook ID and the LinkedIn ID appear to have a very high level of uh, accuracy or truth behind them. <clears throat> so we didn't want to create a network of a bunch of fake people uh, around. So we really require that just because of the high level of authentication that those networks provide. If you did Instagram, we'd have like a whole bunch of, you know, I myself have multiple Instagram accounts or multiple Twitter accounts. I haven't filled out a lot of my profile information. I may or may not even have a photo up. Um, so we just thought that that would degrade the quality of the network too much. Although we do realize that we're actually leaving users on the table, people that don't have Facebook or don't have LinkedIn, actually that can't get into our network. But we try to maintain, and the reason we did was to maintain a high quality of people in the network. Good question. Other questions? Nothing like Game of Thrones this season? <laughs> so we're, we're at uh, 8 o'clock, or a little bit past, but we should certainly take a few more questions as well. Well, guys, we'll, uh, uh, any, any last uh, question? Otherwise, we'll actually be up here and feel free to kind of come up and chat with us directly. I do want to uh, give quick bit. Please, if you have an iPhone, download uh, Social Radar, one word, check it out. Email me directly, Michael at Social Radar, Lee at Social Radar, Roberto at Social Radar. Uh, this only works until you start having people same first name. Right now, it's policy against that. Um, also, follow me on Twitter, at Michael Chasen, or on Instagram, Michael Chasen, or friend me on Facebook, Michael Chasen. Um, <laughs> definitely would be interested in connecting, and especially because there's a, a, a lot of people in this room with a high degree of UI, UX, expertise, or just general interest uh, in that. We love all of the feedback you can provide, and mostly just the good, the uh, bad stuff, because we already assume good, no need to send us that in an email, um, but let us know if you have ideas for improvements. We love getting extra feedback, questions, comments. We appreciate all of it. 
Thank you very much for coming, everybody. We'll be here to answer any other questions. I appreciate it.
Hi everybody, my name is Dan. Uh, I'm helping Steve out along with some other folks in the room with organizing for Action Design DC. Um, we have some good news. One is that we're incorporated as a nonprofit. We're actually doing some fundraising now. So if you or your company ideally would like to sponsor events like this or bigger events, please come see me. We're not oh, no discriminate. No, if you want to give us a thousand dollars, we will take it. Don't worry. Two thousand is fine too. And soon that will be tax deductible because we're incorporated as a nonprofit. Um, we are also planning a conference for September. Uh, we have some people who are starting to reach out to speakers and think about workshops and interactive activities that we could do at that conference. Uh, we're locking down venues. And so if anybody's interested in organizing that, just come see myself, Steve, or some of the other people in the room uh, who are organizing. And then the last thing was around small group discussions. So we've had a few different small group discussions. Um, I led the last one on financial services and talking about uh, kind of how people interact with financial services on a personal level. But if anybody has ideas or wants to lead one, just let us know. We're, uh, we actually have some venues now that are planned ahead of time. So about 20, 25 people. If you think it's a good topic that people in this group would be interested in and you want to take the lead, we're opening that up to the group. Speaking of volunteers, we, um, uh, our New York group has launched. Um, and it looks like we're starting the San Francisco one shortly. This is the mothership. This is the largest one in the country of this type, talking about behavioral research and the intersection of uh, product design. So we'd like to leverage this, the large group here. If you know folks in San Francisco, New York, other cities for that matter, who are interested in getting involved in these topics, please come talk to me. I'll connect you with the organizers there. Okay? And uh, with that, um, next, oh, yeah, we have our videographers tonight. Thank you, Tony. Um, who is doing this for free and excellently. Okay. It has um, flyers up by the empanadas, well, by which, by the way, there are more of them, so please eat them, uh, which has the information where you can find the video. I will also send this out um, via email, and you can, guys, you can learn more about their services. They are also available for other meetups, is that correct? Excellent. Can we share events that are outside of DC? Uh, yes, if, uh, if if it's somewhere in the area that people think will be interested, absolutely. Uh, but we also have an online presence for folks who aren't in DC to see see other events on the West Coast, etc. Okay. Well, uh, just to share an event, um, if you love dance or love to use dance to create whatever mission you have, and also have an interest in behavior design or behavior change. Stanford is doing their second annual Design for Dance conference on May 1st. I literally just got off of the bus. Um, I'm, the I'm the like event director. So if you want to talk about dance or behavior design, behavior change, yeah. Okay, I have to admit, I didn't know where you were going with that. <laughs> 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 I was like, yeah, that's an example of things we don't want. Nicely done. <laughs> there are a lot of cool things going on at Stanford. Uh, Nir Yall, one of our board members of this group, um, he just held the Habit Summit out in uh, San Francisco, and he will be coming and speaking, um, whether he likes it or not, at our conference in September as well. Um, Ronnie, I know you have, a, you have an announcement. I have an announcement. I'm Ronnie Lipton, and I don't want your thousand dollars, but I do want your information graphics challenges for a book I'm writing with the great Carl Hu. And we're sending around a survey. Um, if you only answer the first questions about your challenges, as Michael talks so much about, I'd really appreciate it. I happen to have memorized the URL. It's bit.ly slash 1djwauv. And only the D and the U V are capped. And for those of you who do not have the tremendous memory power that she has, we will send that out by email. And uh, by the way, she helped me when I was writing my book, and a lot of other folks here did. Wonderful community, so please get involved. I mean, you're immensely helpful for me, and I appreciate it, too. Thank that's you. Well me, so. Great good for me. Um, all right, so I think that's it. Uh, next month, May 13th, we have Kelvin Kwong, who is the head of product guy for Jawbone Up. Okay? And he's flying out from San Francisco for us. Um, we will, uh, we're going to talk about specifically theirs and the application of behavioral science in wearable technology. Like this one, don't tell them I was wearing a competitor. With that, I uh, hope to see all you guys uh, next month. Thank you so much. Thank you.